This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends show. I'm your host, Jeff Dice. We're very happy and pleased to be joined this morning, Inauguration Day Friday, I might add, uh, by John Tamney, a name I'm sure many of you know. But if you don't know, uh, you really ought to be reading and following him. John is the uh, editor of Real Clear Markets. He also writes quite a bit on political economy for Forbes magazine. He is a senior fellow at Reason. And he also wrote a book a couple of years that Regnery put out uh, that we carry in our own bookstore called Popular Economics, What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James Can Teach You About Economics. And I think it was an attempt uh, to bring home some of these theoretical concepts uh, to, to real world action. And with that, uh, we welcome John Tamney. How are you doing today, John? I'm great. Uh, thank you for having me on, Jeff. Well, it is Inauguration Day. I, I've seen you have written uh, a fair bit about both Trump and some of his cabinet picks. Uh, g- give us your overarching thoughts. What do you, what do you think of Trump pro and con? Uh, what I like about Trump is probably what many do. Uh, he is not like other politicians. I like that he kind of says what's on his mind. Uh, at the same time, I'm terrified by him. Uh, trade is the purpose of our work. Uh, to import is the reason that we get up and go to work every day. Uh, Trump wants to limit our ability. He's bought into this falsehood that's confused thinkers for years that somehow imports are what hurt us when, in fact, imports are the reward for all of our work. Um, it also terrifies me that he thinks you can devalue your way to prosperity. Um, devaluation is the biggest enemy prosperity has ever known simply because it's the biggest enemy of, of investment. And so I, I, I like the change. I don't like politicians in general. But it terrifies me he could really be bad if he uh, gives in to his worst instincts. Do you think there's a difference fundamentally be- between his vision or view of, of global trade and markets and what Hillary's might have been? Um, yes, I, I, I legitimately do. Now, I base this on the fact that her husband was a free trader, and I feel like she ultimately would have been – Uh, guided by some of his logic. Um, I think Hillary moved against free trade simply because she thought it was politically expedient. I think in Trump's case, when you look at his commentary and you look at his commentary going back to the 80s, we're talking about someone still living in the 1980s who back then felt that Japan was the biggest threat to the United States and thinks China is today. I would make the argument that if Japan and China didn't exist, we'd have to invent them. So good have both those countries been for U.S. economic growth. So it concerns me. I think Hillary would have been more moderate um, had she been been elected. That's not that's not me giving a preference to her. But I think on trade, she would have been better. Well, there's also the the areas of nationalism and, of course, war and peace. And, and as you well know, one knock on libertarians is that we're so focused on trade and economics and GDP. And, you know, we'd sell our grandmothers for a few more uh, points of prosperity. Uh, do you think Trump is less likely maybe to set the world on fire than Hillary would have been? Um, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, he says interesting things about uh, North Korea, as in that's China's problem. And I tend to agree with that. He tends to say that the rest of the world, particularly the rich world, needs to take on or, or foot the bill for more of its defense. I think that is ultimately a peaceful concept. I don't think the world is made more peaceful when the U.S. is its policeman. But you hit on something that's important to me that um, – I'm preaching to the choir and saying it to you. Guys like us love economic growth and free trade simply because we think that is the cheapest and best foreign policy mankind ever conceived. And so when people criticize us for our love of of, of open trade and open markets, they miss why we think it's so important because we love peace more than anyone. Yeah, it's interesting, though, that they also don't see tariffs and trade sanctions as as acts of war, and they don't see domestic aggression against citizens in the form of what I would argue aggression, in the form of regulations and taxes. They don't see that as as acts of war um, amongst our friends on the left. Yeah, I love how you put that. I I, I think you're so right. Um, and and again, 
between what we know is that when people are when individuals are trading with one another, war becomes very expensive. It becomes costly because they're not serving one another's needs. Um, to bring in someone who's known for being of the left, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy always said to his son, John, war is bad for business. And it is. It staggers me that an economics profession, almost to a man and woman, would say that that uh, the World War II ended the Great Depression, that war stimulates <laughs> the economy. Uh, Mises put that so well in his book, Liberalism, that in fact, war is the ultimate depressive concept and but yeah I, I love how you expand it to beyond the shooting <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen if you recall a few years ago uh the earthquakes in japan uh caused honda dealerships across the united states to be short on both automobiles and parts for about six months so the idea that we're ever going to have another war with japan uh, is a non-starter but john i'd love to turn to your articles in real clear markets a couple days called no mr president-elect the dollar is not too strong and, and I got to tell you, I love this article because there's even a lot of good folks on the free market side. I might throw out Larry Kudlow, who talks a lot about King Dollar. I, explain to us, you know, this fetish, this enduring fetish for exports over imports. Why do so many of us believe this? All I can think is that people still believe after all this time that when people are buying from you, you're prosperous. Well, OK, that's true. But. Really, why do we get up in the morning every day? Why do we work for dollars? We're working for all the things we don't have. Our goal from the day we start working to long after we retire is to import. That is that is the source of our prosperity, what we can command in return for our toil. Yet somehow economists have turned that on its head and it doesn't surprise me. I think it's a ridiculous profession. Economists believe that Imports actually hurt us, and exports are what strengthen us. What an odd thing. Well, but you get in, in, in the article, you get into how devaluing the dollar uh, simply devalues the, the power of, of average people's wages. Okay, let me ask you this. You talk about measuring in yardsticks and how these things don't really matter. Would you agree with, when Rothbard says, we don't care about the money supply per se? Uh, do you think that's correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, how arrogant for us to presume what the money supply should be. I think Mises put it brilliantly in the theory of money and credit. He said, no, and I paraphrase lightly, no nation or individual need ever worry about having too little money. And his point was, if you're productive, if a country's productive or an individual's productive, money supply is always going to find that individual. Beverly Hills and Greenwich and Manhattan never have a money supply problem because there's lots of productive people in those places. And so you never worry about money. What you worry about is this measure, because that's all it is, is it stable? Because how awful if you're working for money, and per Mises once again, you're not working for money, you're working for what money can be exchanged for. How cruel if suddenly that ticket that you're working for is devalued because that's the sole reason you're working to get what you don't have to import. If they're devaluing the currency, they're defeating the sole purpose of your work because suddenly the dollars you exchange your toil for buy less. Well, do you think that stability in and of itself is a goal? In other words, if a currency is volatile relative to other currencies or relative to the goods people want to buy, uh, that, that means that uh, workers have a harder time knowing what they're going to be able to afford, and it means business owners have a harder time knowing their, you know, budgeting their future costs. So, is a is a rapidly or widely fluctuating currency is that a bad thing in and of itself? Of course, it's a bad thing because it deprives money of its sole purpose. Uh, bringing Adam Smith into the conversation, the sole use of money is to circulate consumable goods. I would just add to it: the other sole use of money is to facilitate investment. What are investors buying when they commit capital to new ideas? Uh, they are buying dollar or currency income streams in the future. Well, so if the currency is volatile or if it's constantly being devalued, you've reduced a great deal of incentive to uh, commit resources to the future or to delay your consumption of resources. So stability is essential. Um, I'll point out here, my views are evolving. Historically, I've said 
the best way to do this. Markets happened upon gold long ago is a great way to measure the value of a currency. I'm still for a gold standard, given the choice between what we have now, a floating currency and, and gold. I think Mises got this right, too, in the theory of money and credit, that if governments didn't create money, obviously market actors would create money very quickly because it facilitates trade among producers. I'm guessing JP Morgan, Walmart, and Visa would do a much better job of creating stable money that we'd all want to earn and exchange with than does the U.S. Treasury. Well, if stability is good and wild fluctuations are bad, isn't slow erosion bad too? In other words, the Fed's, well, you know, the Fed has an express policy uh, of you know, about 2% inflation targeting per year. I isn't that crazy too, if we think about it properly? Oh, it's completely nutty because I don't have to tell you that if your goal is 2% inflation, what you're trying, you're going to do is double the price level or devalue the dollar by name the percentage over 36 years. The only thing I would say about the Fed is the Fed doesn't view inflation in the way that you and I do. Uh, you and I view inflation as a devalue of the unit of account, in our case, the dollar, um, where, it, where it just it, – it is devalued. The Fed views inflation as too much economic growth, which is really strange because if you look throughout global economic history, in, uh, economic growth is the biggest enemy of rising prices mankind has ever known. I cite the uh, original mobile phone was $4,000. The original uh, laser printer was $17,000. Uh, early flat screen TVs cost $25,000 plus. Economic growth pushes down the prices of everything. The Fed thinks in its infinite unwisdom that economic growth drives up prices. It staggers me that people take those people seriously. But even the financial journalism world does. You're, a, you're a, a, an economic and financial journalist. Are you ever shocked at, at what you read about the Fed in mainstream financial publications? Uh, Jeff, I'll one-up you on that. That is the reason I write about this stuff. I used to work on Wall Street. I'd watch CNBC and read the newspapers, and I'd read about how growth causes inflation and all these other nonsensical concepts. And I thought, I've got to get into this because I grew up in the 1970s. I know what inflation is, and economists and journalists who who claim to be experts on this and, and the people who report on these experts do not have a clue about what inflation is. So it made it, it – that's what got me into the field I'm in. <laughs> well, we only have time for one more question. So I'll ask you this. Given the current reality and what most people probably believe about trade, about the Fed, about the dollar, et cetera, you know, what are some small things a Trump administration could do either in the Treasury Department or at the Fed itself? We know he's at least spoken to John Allison, the former Cato head, uh, about a position, perhaps vice chair at the Fed. You know, what are what are some r realistic things that Trump could do conceivably over the next four years that that would uh, would make John Tamney happy. Well, uh, this is where people will disagree with me, but I think if you look at history, you don't need a central bank to devalue the currency. Um, we were devaluing the dollar long before we had the Fed. I think the, the dollar is a is a treasury concept, which means it's a president concept. Presidents get the dollar they want. A Reagan and Clinton largely wanted a strong dollar; they got it. Uh, Bush Jr., Carter, Nixon wanted a weak dollar. They got it. What Trump could do is just be quiet and tell his Treasury Secretary and those officials to be quiet, to stop complaining about China and the value of its currency. That quietude would signal to the markets that we believe in the importance of a strong dollar. That's that's what I'm. That's the most I can hope for. In my perfect world, they legalize private money because I do think, just as market forces bring us computers, socks, and shoes of all shapes and sizes, I think market actors would bring us much better, more stable money um, that we would much prefer to earn over what the U.S. Treasury issues. But that's an idealistic dream of mine. Yeah, but I like the idea that you could legalize competing currencies right alongside. Uh, the, the dollar. Let the Fed keep doing what it's doing. Let the Treasury keep doing what it's doing, but simply allow people to use other forms of payment, both in private business and, and to pay their taxes without putting them in jail for it. Absolutely. Imagine what that would do, that kind of competition. Um, I would be very happily earn a Walmart dollar or a Visa dollar. I think many other others would too.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, our guest is John Tamney from Real Clear Markets and also a great writer at Forbes. I really recommend you check him out. He is that rarest of rarities. He is a financial journalist who actually understands economics, and, and he brings to mind uh, sort of a modern-day version of Henry Hazlitt in that sense, in that he writes in a very accessible uh, way rather than an academic style. Uh, John, we're so happy that you joined us. We appreciate your time, and ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.